Thank you very much, Louise. It's a great pleasure to be with you virtually. And um, uh, maybe at some point you can explain to me the name full circle um, and whether we are coming full circle. My subject is, can a dictatorship be a member of the EU? That is a question actually asked by Jan Werner Müller in relation to Hungary about seven years ago. And I, in a sense, owe the question to him. It's also a question that was addressed by Jean Monnet near the end of his life. And Jean Monnet's answer was, there can be a dictatorship in Europe. That's certainly possible. There cannot be a dictatorship in the European community. And this is, of course, as you all know, the constitutional theory of the European Union. You just take the Treaty on European Union, and if you think about it, Article 2, of course, Article 5, Article 6, Article 7, Article 9, Article 10. I mean, it is extraordinary, actually, how much emphasis there is specifically on democracy um, in the Treaty on European Union, more than in many national constitutions. So the the answer in constitutional theory is absolutely not. Um, this is a democratic community of democracies. By the way, interestingly, this question was first posed in the 1960s in relation to Franco's Spain. And many people at that time argued, well, look, it's, it's just an economic community. So there's no problem with having Franco Spain in there, but it was decided at that point already, no, it has to be a democracy. And that emphasis on democracy has grown and grown. It grew through the 1970s with Spain and Portugal and Greece coming in. It grew yet more in the whole logic of enlargement with the development of the Copenhagen criteria and so on. And yet Hungary, is a full member state of the European Union, and Hungary is not a democracy. Now, that will seem to some a bold claim, but I think it's entirely defensible. It, the, the state of play in Hungary is well beyond, quote unquote, illiberal democracy. Illiberal democracy, which of course, strictly speaking, is a contradiction in terms like fried snowballs, a democracy is liberal or it's nothing. But illiberal democracy is a useful term to describe a liberal democracy in decay, under threat. Um, and, and some would say the United States nearly came to that point, but certainly Poland at the moment, and I would argue Slovenia, are in that illiberal democracy stage. But Hungary is way beyond that. In the Freedom House rankings, it is the only EU member state to be ranked as partly free. If you look at the well-known VDEM rankings, it is way, way down the list. It is in practice, what has sometimes been called a democratura, a mixture of democracy and dictatorship, or to be more technical, a hybrid uh, competitive authoritarian regime. One thing we have to understand, of course, is it doesn't look like that on paper. And the reason it doesn't look like that on paper is that the whole of post-1989 Hungary was about member state building, creating a state that would be an acceptable member of the EU. Remember, Hungary was the first post-communist state to apply to join the EU. So all the institutions were built up for 15 years to meet the Copenhagen criteria, to meet the demands of the European institutions, to look like a democracy. And what Viktor Orban has brilliantly done since his election victory in 2010 is to keep that magnificent facade in almost every area, but to erode democracy from within. Salami slicing, a great Hungarian tradition. Salami slicing piece by piece, partly by formal means, 
because unlike the law and justice in Poland, he got a constitutional supermajority in 2010. So he can actually change the electoral law, change certain fundamental provisions. Um, but, but much more by changing the reality. So just to mention a few elements of, of why it's not a democracy. Extensive gerrymandering of electoral districts, Hungarians outside Hungary and the neighboring, neighboring countries, up to 5 million people, up to 50% of the domestic population, depending how you count, um, have citizenship and have the vote in the election. Um, and other changes to the electoral law so that a bare majority of the vote achieves two thirds of the seats. Um, the state administration is almost entirely controlled by Fidesz and its vast resources are used for the purposes of Fidesz. Uh, this was a point the OSCE monitors made very forcefully on the 2018 election, that you cannot have a fair election if the entire resources of the state, including, by the way, lots of EU funds, which I will come to, are devoted to the service of one party, the billboards, the advertising, and so on. The judiciary has been almost entirely gleichgeschaltet. All 15 members of the Constitutional Court have been appointed under Fidesz. Um, the regulatory authorities are also under very direct control so that, for example, tax policy and regulation policy can be used as an instrument of politics. The media, and of course, you cannot have a free and fair election without uh, media pluralism, once again, have brilliantly preserved the appearance of pluralism. But the reality behind it is one of extensive control. And the way modern authoritarians control media is not through censorship. Censorship is so vieux jeu, so yesterday. It's through ownership. So what you have, you have owners, friendly oligarchs, who either are put up to buying certain media, or are rewarded by extensive uh, public contracts, often with EU money, in other areas of their business, plus all the state advertising budget is only spent for friendly media, while punitive imposts are imposed on private media, extensive tax uh, investigations, um, regulatory finangles. The, the latest example of this is really the last major independent radio station, Club Radio, has just been closed down. Uh, education, of course, uh, the classic example of this is the way CEU was driven out of Budapest, and now we have a Chinese university, Fudan University, coming in its place. But in a sense, more serious is the whole ideological occupation of both higher and secondary education by the, by the party state. Um, just a little illustration of how different, to use the French terms, the pay réel is from the pay légal, is a little video that Viktor Orban posted just after the 2018 election. And it was a video of things he found frightfully amusing about the campaign. And one of the very amusing clips is an exchange between him and the head of the National Election Oversight Authority. Um, a man called Andras Pati, um, says, Orban, I read in the papers that Pati find me. Ha ha. I feel really sorry, Mr. Prime Minister. Deadpans Pati in response. And they all have a good laugh because they all know that the reality is that while on paper you will have all these checks and balances, these independent institutions, um, uh, uh, the reality is very different. So Hungary is not a democracy and things are not getting better, they're getting worse. Why has the EU allowed this to happen or arguably facilitated this happening? Um, let me suggest a short list of reasons. I'm sure you'll be able, sitting in Brussels, many of you, to add some more. 
and I'll be interested to hear what Heather has to say on this, but quick short list. First of all, very simply, the EU had so much else on its plate in the last 10 years. We had the Eurozone crisis, we had Ukraine, we had the refugee crisis, we had Brexit, we had Trump. So to some extent, people just didn't notice or only notice out of the corner of their eye, particularly since Viktor Orban is such an accomplished politician and schmoozer and was a very collaborative colleague in all the European Council meetings and the EPP, which I will come to. Secondly, more fundamentally, a fundamental problem of the whole history of European integration is the divorce between the Europe of values and the Europe of money, which goes right back to the even before the Treaty of Rome. The Europe of values being in the Council of Europe, the Strasbourg Court, and to some extent subsequently in the Helsinki process OSCE, the Europe of money being the European community, now the European Union. And what we've done with Article 2, with the Fundamental Charter and so on and so forth, is essentially to retrofit the values of democracy and human rights into what is still basically an economic community. But in its entrails, fundamentally, it is still an economic community. And what we don't have yet, and we'll come to that, is the really effective linkage in the working of the EU between values and money. Um, thirdly, the fears of other member states. None of us are perfect. Many of us have blemishes in respect of democracy and human rights. And there are many, many member states who fear that next in line might be them. Fourthly, and of course, absolutely crucially, the EPP, as you all know. Um, David Cameron's biggest mistake to leave the EPP. Viktor Orban's biggest win was to stay in the EPP until this week. And uh, which in my view is a scandal, a moral and political scandal that Fidesz was allowed to remain in the main center-right grouping, the grouping of the parties, which in many ways were the parties of the European project, at least for the first 30 years. Why? Well, partly Viktor Orban's extraordinary political skill, partly appeasement, and remember that the logic of appeasement was well-intentioned. The kinds of arguments one heard from people like Manfred Weber were precisely the arguments of appeasers, that it's better to keep them inside the tent, we better keep uh, talking, if not, they will just become more radicalized and jo jo go off and join the far right and so on. Classic arguments of appeasement. Then there is a really interesting point. I mentioned the, the emphasis on democracy in the treaty. But of course, the democracy being talked about in Article 10 is democracy at the EU level. And ironically, what has happened here is that measures that were designed to address the democratic deficit at EU level have made it more difficult to address the erosion of democracy in a member state. Because actually Article 10 explicitly mentions European political parties. And as the parliament has been given more power, as the European political groupings have been given more power, as the Spitzenkandidaten were introduced, so it became more and more important to have the largest grouping, or at least a very large grouping. Ergo, those Fidesz MEPs were more important. So the, the logic of democracy inside the EU has actually cut against the logic of defending democracy in a member state. Um, and then I'm afraid, and again, I'm talking about the EPP, there has been a rather shabby game going on. Uh, some of you who remember Eastern Europe in the 1970s and 80s will remember there was an old Soviet bloc joke 
about people working in large state factories, which was, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. So the, the modern version of that is Viktor Orban's, we pretend to be a democracy and you pretend to believe us. And there was more than a little of that going on. Fifth, Germany. The EPP could long since have swung another way if the CDU CSU group had decisively gone for the expulsion of Orban. But Hungary has such a strong traditional relationship with Germany, which feels it has to, Hungary to thank for German unification along with others. German business is so powerfully represented in Hungary, the car industry above all, and has such a good relationship with Fidesz and a nice deal there. Uh, the personal ties are very strong. Uh, many people in the CSU fundamentally think Orban was right in the refugee migration crisis. And so for a whole complex of reasons, Germany has not been prepared to put, to, to put its bite, to put its weight behind the defense of democracy in Hungary. Um, since we're in a essentially private gathering, let me share with you what Michael Ignatiev said to me about CAU. He said, you know, the one thing that would have made all the difference for CAU would have been the telephone call from Angela Merkel to Viktor Orban saying this matters to us. And that was a phone call that never came. So Germany, number fifth, and then three other reasons. And again, the list is not complete. Um, and, and my friend, uh, Dan Kellerman has written very well about this. Ways in which the EU unintentionally actually facilitates the consolidation of a hybrid authoritarian regime. First of all, of course, the great central achievement of the EU freedom of movement. Um, some of you may know my research project in Oxford Europe stories. If you look on our website, europeanmoments.com, we have the result of our recent EU wide polling. 74% of Europeans say the EU would not be worth having if it did not provide the freedom to travel, work, study, and live in other member states. An amazing result. So of course, young, energetic, well-educated, liberal Hungarians have taken advantage of these opportunities. One of my former students, Martin Benedek, tells me, who actually works in Brussels, tells me when he goes back to Budapest, virtually none of his schoolmates are there. They're all working somewhere else. Now that's of course an unintended consequence of a good thing, but nonetheless, it is a consequence of the existence of the European Union. Secondly, of course, the EU provides an absolutely secure investment um, framework um, and guarantees and a large single market. So it's very attractive for, uh, uh, for German, but also other companies to locate there. But most importantly, Hungary is a huge beneficiary of EU funds. One cannot overstate the scale of the benefit that comes from EU funds. Estimates over the last 10 years range from a low one of 3.5% of GDP to a high of 7% of GDP. In most years, that is more than the annual growth of Hungarian GDP. 90% of public investment in Hungary has some element of EU funding. And this is not just a general benefit, it is a benefit which is largely distributed through the national government administration controlled by Fidesz. Some of it is used for good purposes. You go to a small town and you know the uh, streets have been redone and the school has been rebuilt with EU funding. Fair enough, redounds to the credit of the government, but a lot of it is used for purposes of patronage. For example, to friend, fr reward friendly media owners, um, reward political clients or partners, not to mention friends and family. As you all know, the both Transparency International and the EU's own OLAF investigations show an extraordinary level of corruption 
and misappropriation in the use of EU funds in Hungary, quite exceptional. And this is a, a huge instrument in the hands of, of Orban and, and Fidesz, and he, he knows it very well. And yet, at the same time, he can run an election campaign targeting George Soros, tar targeting Muslims, clearly xenophobic, and under the motto, Stop Brussels. As you all know, Boris Johnson famously said that his attitude to cake is one should have it and eat it. So in, in England, we call this cakeism. Um, at the moment, Boris Johnson is neither having his cake nor eating it. That's the result of Brexit. But the man who is a master of cakeism, the man who is having his cake and eating it, is Victor Orban. And Victor Orban is not just a pure opportunist. He has a program. He has an ideological program to say we are the true Europe, the conservative, traditional, Christian, nation-based Europe, and you in Western Europe represent a dangerous, postmodern, decadent variation. And he has a program, I would argue, essentially to de-link EU membership from the regime type of liberal democracy. So this is a fundamental challenge to the EU, both ideologically and constitutionally. Okay, let me turn quickly to what the EU has done about it, can do about it. I'd be very interested to hear from those of you who work in this field, um, because of course the EU has not done nothing, but clearly, it has not yet been enough. And I'm talking mainly about Hungary, but we can come to Poland in the discussion. So we have the rule of law framework, the rule of law instruments. We have article seven, which I think it was right politically to activate, even though we all know that if push came to shove, Poland would veto for Hungary and vice versa. And now we have the rule of law conditionality mechanism agreed at the last European Council. But this is, of course, I mean, it's absolutely got the right idea, which is to make a real linkage between the Europe of values and the, and the Europe of money. That's exactly the right way to go. But as most of you will know, what was pr proposed was already a compromise on the European Parliament proposals. And then in the further compromise on the compromise, brokered by Angela Merkel, by the way, for understandable reasons. I understand why she felt she absolutely had to get the budget and recovery fund through. We're in a huge crisis, but nonetheless, weakens it even more. For those of you who don't know the council conclusions, let me just read you one, two sentences from the conclusions. The, mechanism, the measures under the mechanism will have to be proportionate to the impact of the breaches of the rule of law on the sound financial management of the union budget or on the union's financial interests and the causal link between such breaches and the negative consequences on the union's financial interests will have to be sufficiently direct and be duly established. So it's already narrowed very, very tightly. And then the next sentence reads, the mere finding that a breach of the rule of law has taken place does not suffice to trigger the mechanism. So the mere finding that a breach of the rule of law has taken place does not suffice to trigger a mechanism on the rule of law. Um, in effect, if you add to that the provisions about waiting for the ECJ ruling and clarification, what Orban, that brilliant tactician, that master of the peacock dance has done, is to buy himself another year at least. And that's crucial because it gets him to the spring 2022 elections with a heap of EU funding, a heap of funding flowing in, because it's not only the generous allocation under the budget, it's also a very generous allocation under the recovery fund, which he can use to secure 
his re-election. And anyway, the terms of the mechanism are extremely narrow. It's only rule of law in relation to the use of EU funds. So as Jean Pisani Ferry rather wittily put it, if you were an honest dictator, there'd be no problem at all. That'd be fine. It's only the dishonest dictator. I don't know many honest dictators. So, um, so, so I think one fundamental problem with this is a very narrow focus on rule of law, narrowly understood. One of the things I think we need is to widen the focus, to look more broadly at questions around the quality of democracy, uh, which is after all there in the treaties, there in all the criteria we apply to any accession candidate. To go to Poland for a moment. Um, in Poland this year, the key question for the defense of democracy is no longer the courts. I'm afraid they've largely gone. There are some brave judges who are still holding out. There's a great ombudsman holding out, but basically that's not the front line. The absolutely crucial front line in Poland for the defense of liberal democracy is the independent media. Unlike Hungary, Poland still has a major independent TV station, TVN a major independent newspaper, Gazeta Wyborcza, and the Agora group behind it, significant independent radio stations, Talk FM, for example, and a major independent internet platform, onet.pl, and some others. Many of them, by the way, with foreign owners. TVN is owned by the Discovery Channel, um, uh, onet.pl is, is Ringe Springer. That is a crucial front line. And if we're thinking about how we really want to defend, prevent Poland from going further down the Hungarian path, which, by the way, is clearly and explicitly what Jaroslav Kaczynski and Peace want to do, they, they, they say as much, um, then, then this is one of the key things to focus on at the moment. Now, one or two of you may come back and say, well, you said Hungary is not a democracy. So why is an election going to be so important? After all, if it's not a democracy, why does he have to worry about elections? I don't think Xi Jinping worries very much about elections. But that's a mistake. Because it's not just in democracies that elections matter. Arguably, they matter even more in this kind of hybrid regime, which I've called a democratora. Slovakia 1998. Serbia 2000, remember the peaceful toppling of Slobodan Milosevic began with an election. Uh, the Orange Revolution 2004 began with an election. What's happening in Belarus today be began with an election. So, so elections are actually arguably even more important moments in hybrid regimes in a democratura than they are in a orderly democracy like Germany. So I think those are the kinds of issues on which if we want to think about what the EU can do more, uh, it would be good to focus. And now, Louise, I had understood from, 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 from the exchanges that, that I might pose you a few questions at the end for the breakout group. So if I may, yes. I'm going to do that, even if you've got your own. No, no, great. Okay. So three questions. First of all, how might the EU be more effective in the next year or two with the instruments at its disposal? And maybe Heather could have a stab at responding to these questions. Secondly, how do we think the EU would slash should react if Hungary actually did become an outright dictatorship? That is to say, if in response to a kind of democratic slash velvet revolutionary slash civil disobedience kind of challenge to his rule, rule Viktor Orban resorted to outright repression, going more towards, as it were, Belarus. How would and how should the EU react in that case? There is no provision for expelling a member state. <laughs> 
There is Article 7, but Article 7 will be vetoed by Poland or Slovenia. And then my third question, initially to Heather, but, but then to all of you, is what will it do to the EU if a la longue we continue to have one and maybe several member states that are not democracies, if Orban's vision comes true. Countries that no longer have democracy and therefore also not the rule of law, but are participating fully in the political life of the union, where that undemocratically elected leader is sitting in the European Council making decisions about, for example, relations with Russia or China. We already have had one example from Orban vetoing um, a tougher measure on China. Um, we could well see more of that, particularly after they got their Chinese and Russian jabs. Um, what similarly at the level of the council, similarly in the European Parliament, what does it do to the life of the, the, the political and the legal integrity of the entire union? if you have a country that isn't a democracy and doesn't have the rule of law, what does it do to the credibility of the European Union with European citizens and particularly with young Europeans? Most EU member states now have in living memory experience of dictatorships. For many of them, not just in Central and Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe, but Poland, but, but Portugal and Spain and Greece, the transition to democracy, the EU as a guarantor of democracy, is a really important part of what Europe does. What does it do to the credibility of the union um, if we have member states which are simply not democracies? And again, if you look at europeanmoments.com, we have some very interesting material on how young Europeans really care about that. And finally, what does it do to the credibility of the European Union in the wider world? How can the European Union claim to stand up for democracy and human rights and the rule of law in Asia or Africa or wherever, if among our own members as a country, which is not a democracy and does not have the rule of law? So those are my three questions to kick off the discussion. I look forward very much to um, hearing Heather and then discussing with all of you.